Well, good morning, everybody. Glad you're here. Welcome in the room and online. Uh, it's uh, it's been an important series that we've been in over the last little while. the The series has been called "What the World Needs Now," and it uh, it's a response to the the perplexing, divided, disconcerting time in which we're living. Because these days are that way, aren't they? And part of what's troubling, especially for people like some of you, some of us, is the erosion of uh, the church's impact on our society, on uh, values and morality. And the, the erosion is real. And it leads to times when we feel like uh, kicking the dog or howling at the moon or withdrawing from the world in, in protest. Um, but howling and kicking and protesting, they're not going to change anything. They're not. The only thing we can, we can control is, is us and our behavior and our response. So with that in mind, in this series, we're, we're looking at what we contribute to the problems that exist in our world. Because we do contribute. We absolutely do. Uh, we, we're, we're thinking that way because all through the Bible, all through history, churches and Christians often wander away from God's intent and Jesus' example and the the core foundational message that we're supposed to be proclaiming. We've done that over and over and again. We don't follow Jesus' example. We don't apply his word. We don't respond to the Spirit's leading. It's possible we're not contributing to the problem necessarily too much ourselves, uh, but it's also possible we're not giving the world what God wants us to give. We're not representing the way God wants us to represent. So in the first week of the series, we talked about uh, enjoying or being conscious of uh, more and more that our Heavenly Father is with us. We're, we're called to be mindful, to be present in the presence of God. We're never alone. We have no need to fear. We don't have to be anxious. We don't have to be worried. As Christians, we bring the kingdom of God into every room that we enter. We need to live in the presence of God. He is with us. It's so important we do that. Two weeks ago, week number two, we talked about how the world needs uh, God's people to remain committed to his primary agenda, which is said over and over throughout Scripture. It's grace. Not condemnation, not judgment, not legalism. It's grace. I'm alive. I have hope. I have life because of God's grace. Grace. You have the same. And perhaps the world around us needs us to uh, see the impact that grace has on us and reflect that to those we encounter. In week number three, last week, we talked about the fact that God invites us to champion reconciliation. It's constant in God's intent. His desire for us to be reconciled with him and for us to help reconcile other relationships with those around us. Imagine if we as a group, as a, as a church, uh, here or watching online, were to go out into the world this week and impact the world around us with a sense of God's presence and the healing that can be found in God's grace and the mission to be reconciled instead of conquering or debating or so. Well, today our, our, our focus will be on the impact God desire, desires us to make in our world by living uh, lives not characterized by fear or defeat or anger or competition or discouragement, but lives reflecting the joy that people should have who, who know God, who follow his son, who are invited to demonstrate and proclaim that his joy is, is our strength. A huge part of the positive contribution God invites us to bring into our world is a sense of joy. After all, our God is the happiest being in existence. He's made us for joy. And if that's not a description of you, if you're more skeptical these days than, than hopeful, if you're more dour than alive, if you're more grumpy than rejoicing, if you're more complaining than affirming, if, if th that's true of you, then you're missing. I'm missing life connected to Jesus. We were made for joy. And his joy is a key part of what the world needs. Our text today is Psalm 66. You can turn there if you want or just look at the screen. But listen to this, this challenge. It says this, Psalm 66, verse 1. Shout joyful praises to God, all the earth. Sing about the glory of his name. Tell the world how glorious he is. This psalm is a, is a call to joy. When we have it, when we know it, we, when we express it, verse 4 says everything, everyone on earth will worship you. They will sing your praise. They will shout your name in glorious songs. So, Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll give us a greater sense of joy. 
We can if we try hard enough or if we try at all, we can think of reasons not to be. Uh, perhaps it's from things that have happened in the last few days or last week. There's reasons we hold back on joy. But Father, there's also more reasons for us to be joyful. Help us to shout with joy, as Scripture teaches. Help us to notice what is wonderful. Help us to spread laughter in times like this with a cascading spirit of celebration. Help us to get beyond those times when joy seems elusive. Would you increase our sense of wonder and thanksgiving? Would you touch our broken world? Would you spread joy in us and through us? And now as we open your word, would you teach us, would you show us your example, your guide, your leading, and help us to apply it to our lives, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we're talking a bit about joy. It's a simple, short, little three-letter word, but the definition of joy is, is not simple at all. It's, it's actually quite profound. Joy is not just about having fun. It's not just about optimism or, or happiness. It's, it's deeper than laughter. But let's just start on a you know, shallow end of the pool for a bit. Let's think about laughter. And I want to help us get into the subject by asking you a very simple question. Do you think Jesus laughed? Did Jesus laugh? Scripture doesn't say he ever did. Doesn't say he didn't. But I'm going to give you just about five, ten seconds. If you're sitting with someone that you know, just share the answer with them. Do you think Jesus laughed? Just say yes or no. Just tell, tell them what you think. Okay, we can't quote a verse. We can't show the story where Jesus laughed. Uh, we can't point to a page in Scripture that confirms or denies whether or not Jesus laughed. I, I, but I think there's plenty of evidence pointing to a light spirit within Jesus, a, a ready smile, an eager, full-throated embrace of, of laughter in our Savior. Uh, but the absence of specific examples has compelled some people to believe many dear saints to disregard laughter as not something Jesus did, therefore not something we should engage in. We should keep our faith on a more serious level. We should be more, more, more somber, more strict in our, in our behavior and so in our, in our countenance. People find that, find they can give themselves permission not to laugh than to choose solemnity as being more important. Now the first time I heard someone express an opinion on the question of whether or not Jesus laughed, not in so many words, but the first time I remember thinking about this, was 58 years ago. I can remember the day. It was just on the other side of this wall in a room across the way. All right, this building was a month or two away from being completed in, in its initial construction. And, and uh, after a particular Sunday service at the old church down at 11th and B, people were invited by the building committee. They were the ones responsible for constructing this building to come up here to the new facility to take a tour. They wanted to show people in the neighborhood. They wanted to show people in the community. They wanted to show our church people what this building was going to be like. I mean, people had voted for it, helped pay for it, and so on. It was really a fascinating building, especially 58 years ago. Some of us remember that. But on the tour uh, that, that was given, people came in this room. And it was quite unique in the day. And it still is quite unique, but it was very, very impressive then. And people would come in, they kind of ooh and ah. And then people were taken and shown the lobby, of course. And the little, there used to be a little chapel back there. And the, uh, the office area and the classrooms, which were quite numerous back in the day. And the kitchen was quite impressive and so. And, and the nursery, everybody gave a thumbs up. This is great. For some of the people who took the tour that day, their positive attitude, their enthusiasm, their, their, their uh, uh, gratefulness changed the moment they walked into the fellowship hall, which is on the other side of this wall. Right? Fellowship hall was and is this kind of larger room that we held, had for classes and for children and youth activities for, for back then, uh, you know, wedding dinners and so. But as the, the church people came through, they saw the fellowship hall, some of them for the first time, and it was clear there was, there was something upsetting in that room. There was something uh, uh, out of place, especially for some of the older folks. Any, any of you who were veterans, you remember what that was? What, what was that? Shuffleboard, exactly. This worldly thing called shuffleboard. There wasn't ashtrays there. There wasn't a dance floor. There wasn't a, a beer keg. It was worse. Inlaid into the tile of the floor was shuffleboard. Now, if shuffle, we don't know what shuffleboard is. It, it's, it's really not that big of a deal, but it used to be, you know, oftentimes you'd see it in parks or, or in sometimes schools or cruise ships. Maybe you play the, uh, the, the tabletop version. They sometimes have those in bars and so. 
The game of shuffleboard has, has two target areas at the end of a 20 or 30 foot uh, lane. Uh, you can put a picture here of this outdoor shuffle court, shuffle ball, shuffle ball court, they call it, I think it is. So you stand at one end where it says 10 off or so, and you have these long sticks, and you push this disc down the floor and then keep score. It's kind of like curling without ice. And when I say it's like curling, that's another way of saying it's really stupid. You know, there's no aerobic quality to it. There's not any exercise. I guess it's kind of fun if you like to play games, but we had that in the, in the floor. And my dad, by the way, was the chairman of the building committee, and I was standing next to him as people would come up to him, dismayed that this worldly game had been permanently, permanently installed, etched into the floor of this new edifice, this place of worship, this house of God. I can't believe I paid money. I gave money to support this building. We're doing something so foolish as shuffleboard. I, I think it was Luella's idea, so I'm not going to blame my dad. I think it was uh, Luella. Um, now, I don't know if shuffleboard was a good idea or not, um, but if the people who complained about shuffleboard and the way they complained, if they'd been asked whether or not Jesus laughed, I'm guessing, it's no proof at all, but I'm guessing they would have said no. No. Shuffleboard and game playing and messing around and laughter and fooling around, not in church. We're dealing with sin here. Our faith is serious. It's somber. No shuffleboard. Now, it, it, it kind of blew over in time, especially after the room was carpeted. I don't know how many years ago that would have been. The carpet was laid down and shuffleboard was no longer evident. It was finally gone. But I, I thought about this incident this last week, and, and I wondered if it was still there. And so this week I went into the, into the uh, fellowship hall, and I got a little blade, and there's carpet tiles all over the floor, and I, and I pulled one back. And I knew where to go, because I'd played the game when I was a kid, and like a dog returns to his vomit, I went to this place where shuffleboard had been. And look what I found. Under the carpet, through layers of glue, it's still there. It's still haunting us. It's still staining our, our worship place. Right? It's still there. It's still alive. Often in the history of the church, this one and all churches, Christian people have misunderstood God, I fear. Not about shuffleboard. But they miss out on the deep longing, the deep uh, invitation to participate in celebration and hope and laughter and the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Every human being laughs. We all do. And Jesus was fully divine, but he was also fully human, which means he had to be full of, laugh, full of laughter. Jesus said, I have taught these things so that you may know, and my joy might be complete. That had to include laughter. Because it re-energizes. Games, because they, they help us escape from life sometimes in a way that we need. I mean, think about Jesus. He had very serious things on his mind, but he also had to put up with Peter's nonsense. I think Peter provided a lot of comic relief. A sense of humor and laughter would have had to been necessary for the disciples, certainly for Jesus. And when Jesus healed people, there would have been in the wake of healing these expressions of, 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 of joy and, and, and gratitude when lame people would walk or when when the blind would see for the very first time or the deaf would hear, people would look to Jesus, I'm sure, and they would express outrageous joy. And he would have not just given them a blank stare. When little, a little girl died from a sickness and Jesus raised her to life, what would have happened after that? Would there have been joy? Celebration, sure. When the demon, people demon-possessed were set free, People free for the very first time in their life, they would have been untethered joy, untethered happiness, uncontrolled smiles that would just come to mind, and Jesus would have shared those. The Gospels are filled with joyful, praiseworthy moments and miracles for anyone who had a pulse. If anyone had a pulse, they would have had joy and laughter. Wouldn't they? Well, that's Jesus every week in the series. We've also gone back to some of the foundational stuff in the Old Testament. And let's do that here with the concept of joy and laughter. Do you remember the, the, the names that were used for God in the Old Testament? What, what God was referred to, people didn't want to say God. He was sometimes called Yahweh or sometimes called Elohim or El Shaddai, different words. But among those common names, the way people would refer to God was oftentimes this. He's, he was called the God of Abraham, 
Isaac, and Jacob. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can I remember you referred to that? It wasn't a gene- genealogical kind of a thing. It was a label that included uh, important names that tell a story. So the God of Abraham, his given name had been Abram. It was changed to Abraham because God said, I will make you the father of many nations. That's what Abraham means. God had called Abraham to that mission. To, uh, he promised him a, a vast family of descendants. And that was given to Abraham when he was already quite old. But God did so out of his desire to be connected, to be in relationship, to find a way to be in harmony with his people. And through Abraham, God would bless the world, bless us. So his name was a reminder that God loves. He loves. Jacob was another of the names. That was Abraham's grandson. His story was really a lifelong struggle. We talked a bit about that in the last couple weeks. Struggles with his brothers, struggle with his father, with his uncle. He was a con artist who'd been conned. He was a a liar who'd been lied to. He'd be, he was a manipulator who'd been manipulated. He was all kinds, of, all kinds of challenges. And his name Jacob means one who follows after to take and deceive. Not a very good name. Until one night, a very strange night, when, when, when Jacob wrestled with God or a messenger from God. It's kind of an unusual kind of story. But Jacob hang on, hung on, the whole process hung on with great desperation. And the, the thing he cried out over and over again as he wrestled with God or with God's messenger, he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Finally, uh, Jacob's divine appointment made a move that, that injured Jacob, made him limp for the rest of his life. And the voice came and said to him, you are not in a position to demand or to manipulate God's blessing. It comes as a gift. And in that moment, jo- Jacob saw God's face. He saw him face to face, and, and he received God's blessing because he learned God was there in the middle of his struggles. In his weakness, Jacob was made strong. And God is the God of Abraham, and he's the God of Jacob. He's also the God of Isaac. You know what Isaac means? Laughter. Isaac was born 24 years after God's promise of descendants to this elderly Abraham and elderly Sarah. And when she learned she was pregnant, the text tells us that Sarah laughed. Right? She tried to deny it when you read the text. She tried to, I did not laugh, but God saw it. Abraham saw it. They knew it. And when the child was born, the appropriate months later, uh, to this elderly woman, Sarah said, I will name him Isaac, which means Laughter. Because Sarah said, the, the, the Lord has brought me laughter. She, she laughed when she thought how her maternity bills would all go to Medicare. And they'd never had that kind of thing before. It would cause a great deal of confusion, but she laughed at the thought. And she thought, thinks about how she's going to be clipping coupons for both Pampers and Depends the same time. It's going to be a real mess. She thinks about how her, her entire little family are, are going to be eating strained prunes and rice cereal. Because there isn't a tooth in the mouth of any of them. It's going to be kind of a strange deal. And she thought about the day her baby would push himself around in a baby walker and, her, and his mom or dad are going to chase after them with their walkers of their own. It's going to be quite a, quite a scene. And God is the God of Abraham and the God, of, the, 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 the God who loves. God is the God of Jacob who's with us in our, in our pain and struggles. He's also the God of Isaac, the God of laughter. There's an ability that we must try real hard not to lose as we age, like Sarah and Abraham, the ability to feel, to demonstrate, and to experience laughter, and to extend joy. Kids don't have to work at that very hard. It just kind of comes out of them. They giggle when they discover 10 little toes at the end of their chair. They giggle and laugh. We all have that. Toddlers, uh, they go from smiles to giggles and more laughter. It happens when we, we tickle them, when we make funny faces at them. It happens when we blow on their bellies. They scream with delight when they play the very first game almost all kids learn, which is peekaboo. I mean, I, that's universal. We play peekaboo. The child looks at us. We duck away, and the kid goes, he's gone. Oh, there he is, and they just get so delighted. There he is. They got this joy. But the greatest calamity of aging for, 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 for many is that we can lose joy. The joy that God gave us at birth. I don't think it was ever God's desire. I mean, change is inevitable. We, 
we, we don't get the same thrill anymore when anyone blows on our belly. I don't. It doesn't do anything for me. Peekaboo doesn't do it for us. But I still believe we're supposed to be in touch with this unique human ability to have joy, not to just succumb to the weight of our responsibilities. There are serious things we have to do. Work has to be done. We have to grow up. We can't always be silly and laugh and joke all the time, but listen to the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, Be joyful always. Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again. Rejoice. Psalm 66, again, God's word commands us to shout joy. Shout with joy to God all the earth. Rejoice. Galatians 4.15, Paul's concerned for friends who seem to have lost something. He said, what's happened to all your joy? What's happened? It's a great one for all of us to consider because we need it. The world needs joy. We need joy. What has happened to all your joy? Jesus was in the most serious mission in, in the history of the universe. He had all kinds of emotions, grief and anger and disappointment and weariness and loneliness. But the most significant descriptor of Jesus' life was he was joyful, appropriately serious when he need be, but also incredibly filled with joy. You read about him, what defined his life was delight and satisfaction and gladness and confidence and, and pleasure for life resulting in praise and thanksgiving and rejoicing. Those poured out of Jesus. Mark chapter 10, verse 13 to 16, it, it talks about the day that, that children were trying to get to Jesus. He'd gathered in this place to speak to his people and, and, and children were clamoring to get to him and the grumpy disciples were trying to shoo them away. This, I don't think it was the first time. Because Jesus was sort of a magnet for kids. Maybe it was his contagious full-throated laughter that had that had a part of that, or the carnival atmosphere of, 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 that surrounded him all the time. But as parents pressed to be near Jesus, toddlers were stretching out their arms, trying to get away from their parents to go to him. And Jesus had made his way to the shade, to this place where he could sit down and, and teach like a king before his subjects, but he didn't demand pomp, pomp or ceremony that a king would have. He was more like a playful father. And even the small, joy-filled children wanted to be with him and near him. The disciples didn't care for that situation. They, they were serious. And kids were a waste of Jesus' time. And they crossed their arms and they had this, this grump, gruff look on their face and they shooed parents away and stopped those holding smaller children from nudging the older kids forward and so And they tried to stop the kids. It was so serious, they thought. But they'd missed Jesus' heart. So he became serious with them for a moment and, and shot them a glance. He said, come on, guys. Come on. And then to all the kids, he said, come. And as the serious, disgruntled disciples started to move aside, the less shy children rushed forward. And I want you to listen to the way a gal named Janet Coble imagined the scene. She said, the children's pudgy fingers found themselves playing with Jesus' beard and nose, and he laughed, and their unrestrained giggles echoed his music. One boy with curly hair, a scrape on his forehead, babbled, a silly story about the puppies he'd seen the, the other day, and somehow Jesus managed to listen and respond despite being surrounded by so many other children. Startling big brown eyes greeted him as he turned his head in response to someone who was tugging on his sleeve, and the eyes, eyes smiled back from this little girl, and she didn't have anything to say, but she was clearly determined to climb up into his lap, and so he helped her up. And the pleased parents would have stood back and they watched these strong, this strong, purposeful man who seemed to know just what to do with all these kids. And his able hands caressed their heads and smoothed their hair and tweaked their noses. And the parents' hopes for their children had brought them there because of this dynamic man. And he, they brought them there so he would teach them and bless them and bestow all kinds of wonderful promises. And he did. Clearly, he was no blustering politician anxious to kiss babies to win the parents' loyalty. This was a man who loved children and simplicity and trust and straight lines rather than bent ones, and he loved laughter and hugs and joy and not just from the children. Where do you fit into that picture? Are you, would you have been the proud parent standing at a distance and vicariously sharing the joy that another person experiences with God? 
Are you, are you like a child who can come to the king and bounce on his knee? Are you like one of the disciples standing at a distance with folded arms, cynically disapproving of those who dare frolic with God? Honestly, is there, is there room in your serious heart for laughter, for rejoicing? Or is it too much of a bother? Are the issues you face in life overwhelming a lighter faith-based perspective? I, uh, we often talk around here, and Matt and Dan and I will talk about it sometimes, how when we're teaching on a particular subject, uh, things will happen during that week that just sort of, you know, prove our need. And, and it's interesting. I, I knew today I wanted to be lighthearted and joy-filled, and but it's been an awful week for me. Awful. You know, Matt came back from Minnesota bragging you know, about the Chargers. That was really annoying. And then I, I never get these. We went camping last Sunday afternoon, and, and, and while camping, I developed this toothache. I never get toothaches. But I got a corker of a toothache, and it just my whole head is throbbing. I went to the dentist, and as soon as we got back, and he said, you've got a decayed tooth down here. Uh, the, one of the bottom teeth, right in front of a, a very impacted wisdom tooth, and he kept on saying, oh, this is going to be trouble. And, and so what he determined is that tooth, the, the decayed one needs to be pulled out, and you can't do that to the wisdom tooth, so I'm going to have to get that pulled out as well. And so that's scheduled for Tuesday. It's going to be a great day. Right? And, and all week long, they, they, they referred me on to the oral surgeon. The oral surgeon didn't call me back, and I had to call them and they say, well, what's the problem? And they say, I said, I got a bad tooth. And they say, well, what's the problem? I said, well, it hurts. You know, so they're going to pull these two teeth and it's going to just be awful. I'm going to be gauze wrapped in there. It's going to be, I'm going to look not as good looking as I do now. And, and our staff is going to tease me and, and Rebecca's going to think I look old and it's going to be just annoying. And my head hurt and my ears hurt and my jaw hurts and my wife hurts and, you know, it's just, Count it all joy. But I can. I can. This is temporary. And there's a lot of pains that are harder, but those are temporary as well. As hard as they may be. So I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to just kind of give us three ways to apply this concept of joy and laughter that we see all through Scripture, this thing that we're supposed to, I think, give to our world because the world needs it from us. I mean, they don't just need it for themselves. They need to see it from God's people. And it's sadly rare. So three things we need to do to increase our, our, our joy, our reputation, three things God loves. First is laughter. Uh, we have sort of a reputation for being a fun church. We do. But believe it or not, I don't think we laugh enough. There's, there's, there's vital parts of life that we do engage in on a regular basis. And, and, and I told this to a rather long-faced, serious person a while back, and they shot back, sure, you think humor is important, but that's because you like to laugh. I don't like to laugh. Well, I don't like to laugh either. I need to laugh. Proverbs 17, 22, it's on your bulletin. The cheerful heart is good medicine. But a crushed spirit dries up the bones. I mean, if there ever was a man who, who, was, who had reason to not to laugh, who bound in a reason to be serious, it was the Apostle Paul. Listen to his own description of the life he was having as a Christian, 2 Corinthians 11. He says, I've been beaten time, times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received the 39 lashes because 40 would kill. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I, not rod, uh, Papika, by the way, this is a stick, right? Um, Three, uh, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. That's not rod popping either. Uh, three times I was shipwrecked, spending night and day in the, o in, in, in the ocean. I have been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers and robbers, from those who wanted to destroy me. I've been in labor and in hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Paul's journey had been so difficult. He was arrested and chained to Roman guards. But while he was in prison, Paul continued to write these letters to churches that he cared for, like the Philippian church. In that letter, Paul's constant theme was joy. He's in prison. He's been beaten, shipwrecked. All his constant theme was joy. He said, rejoice, be happy, be joyous, laugh and rejoice in the Lord. He was stressing that laughter and humor and joy do so much to slow us down and provide a sense of rest, develop a deep sense of peace within us when we do. 
old thing I have from Chuck Swindoll. He said, basically, there are two kinds of people. People who choose joy and people who don't. People who choose joy pay no attention to what day of the week it is or how old they are or what level of pain and weirdness they're in. They have deliberately decided to laugh again because they have chosen joy. People who do not choose joy, they miss the relief, the, the life that laughter can bring. So we need to laugh. Maybe it's with jokes. I don't tell jokes. I really don't. I don't tell jokes. You know, you know I walk, you know, pastor and rabbi. I don't, I don't tell jokes, but I like to, to read them when, they, when the good ones come. Like I, I got this a while back. I mean, this is old stuff. But these are actual lines from country music. I mean, who wouldn't enjoy the beauty of lyrics like this? Mama, get the hammer because there's a fly on daddy's head. That's a great song. Or her teeth were stained, but her heart was pure. It's another country western lyric. You're only a splinter, I slid down. You were only a splinter as I slid down the banister of life. Touches your heart. A lot of old country western lyrics talk about leaving and, you know, missing each other. Like, I am so miserable without you, it's like having you here. (laughs) Or this one. I still miss you, baby, but my aim is getting better. My wife, you've heard this one. My wife ran off with my best friend and I miss him so much. Or if I shot you when I wanted to, I'd be out of jail by now. That's a good one. <laughs> my favorite, you're the reason our kids are so ugly. That's another. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3, 4, there's a time to weep, but also a time to laugh. A time to mourn, but also a time to dance. God loves laughter. It's not joy, but it leads us to, leads us to joy. So tell jokes and, and read the funny pages and play pranks on one another. Honestly, we should play more pranks. We really should. Back in the day, I, my very, very first church, my, my boss was Bruce, and we, he teased and he laughed a lot. And one day, Holly and I had this idea, and he had just got brand new carpet in his office, and he was kind of boastful about his office. He had the big one and all that kind of stuff and all the nice stuff. And so we went in, in the cover of darkness, we moved all the furniture out of his office, and we bought 500 square feet of sod grass. And we laid Tyvek construction paper down from end to end, and, and we brought it, we sawed at his office. Grass everywhere. We got little potted plants and little plastic dog poop, and we put it here where his place. And we moved all the furniture back in and closed the door, and that morning he came in, he, it smelled amazing. It really did. And he walked in, it was grass wall to wall, and he didn't say a word all day long. He had meetings, people came in his office, he had to have a seat. He didn't say a word. People said, oh, no, just, that's why I like it. It was great. And then, by the way, if you pull pranks like that on me or anyone else, we cleaned it up. Holly and I cleaned it up because we needed that sod for our backyard. But we, he didn't have to clean it up. We cleaned it up. Pull pranks. Tease, unless people can't take it. But you know, it, it, it's, it's so good for us to do those kind of things, to laugh, to laugh with people. It's so important. That's the first thing. Second thing, which leads to joy. The second thing we should increase in our church and in us that God loves is a sense of adventure. Adventure. Isaiah 40 says, Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, and they will soar like wing, with, with wings of eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And what many people miss in our blur of activity in this world is the activity of hope that comes from the Lord and excitement and purpose and adventure that he gives us. Any work Any activity, any responsibility that lacks um, purpose and power becomes boring, becomes a burden. It makes us very serious and it robs joy. We need to be sure or aware of the many things we can do in life which are really an adventure. This is a small one, but I was thinking about this week. It went on, it was was it Thursday we got this phone call? Yeah, it was Thursday. Uh, email, actually. Uh, Matt walked into my office about 12.30 or 1 o'clock on Thursday afternoon. Now, I'm not saying this to boast because we all could do this and, and not a big deal. But a pastor from Reno, Nevada was traveling. Uh, he was at a conference in, in Michigan. And he was traveling back. And he, he sent the church that e- an email both to Matt and to myself. They went on our website and looked around and so on and thought we were the ones they should talk to. Uh, and, and he said, can me and my son stay at your place for the night? We're, we want to save the money. We're, we're church planters. We don't have a lot. We're looking, do you have a missionary house or a place we could stay for the night? And Matt said, so how are you going to handle it? And I said, how are you going to handle it? I didn't read the email. You read the email. And, and 
this whole charger Viking thing took off. It went a different direction for a while. But he said, you know, I've got the baby at home. He uses the baby an awful lot. We just had a baby. It's so hard. And my wife will be working, and I can't do it all, so we should. And I said, I didn't want to. I don't want to do this. And so I called my wife. You don't want to do this either, do you? And she goes, no, well, I, well, we can. Okay. And I decided I, I would check him out. I went on Facebook. I'd research him just a little bit. And if anything about him was weird, no way. So I looked him up on Facebook and, and so, and, and his, his presenting uh, uh, union with us was that he was Baptist. So that means nothing to me. A lot of Baptists are weird, but beyond Baptist, um, he's a uh, church planner. I love church planners. He has three boys. He has three boys. He coached them all through baseball. They love baseball. I love baseball. I coach my boys. He loves the outdoors. He loves sports. He wants to visit all the states, all the you know, baseball parks and so. I still didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. Um, but I did. I emailed them back, and they showed up that night, and I was trying to watch the Lions game, and they come in, and they want to talk, you know, and so we talked. And we talked about baseball, and our kids, and our world, and it was good. It was good. I, I, I said to him, I said, this is kind of strange what you did, you know, and just kind of reach out to someone you don't know and ask to stay at their house. He said, well, normally I don't do it like this. He said, normally I, I reach out to someone I know or I have met sometime or I know, reach out to someone, a friend of a friend. But I've never been to North Dakota except once where we just kind of clipped the edge because I want to visit all 50 states. And I just clipped the edge down, I think South of Fargo, I think it was where he was, just drove in, drove out. And he said, I don't, don't know anybody here. And so I, I reached out to this other church, Baptist church. Dickinson, and three weeks ago he said, and the guy wrote me back and said, well, maybe, uh, I'll see. Never got back to him, so a week or two later he reached out again, and the guy said, well, maybe, I'm working on it, I'll see. And then on the way he was driving, he wrote out to him again, the guy never responded. And they could have paid for a hotel room, but he said, I, I reached out to you the day we were arriving at, you know, 1230, and you wrote back a half hour later. And he, he didn't say it right. But what he said was, you are the strangest person that I, we've made contact with in this way. I, he tried to say it again. He said, you're the biggest stranger. We've, the most stranger. The most, he didn't know how to say it. Uh, it was unusual for him, too. But it was a little bit of an adventure. Just a small one, not a big one. But he encouraged our, my heart. I think I encouraged him a little bit. He, he sent me back a phone message. I got home just you know, yesterday and I, they'd go, they went through uh, Medora and Painted Canyon. They went on down to the Battle of Bighorn through the Yellowstone, saw wildlife. We talked about North Dakota. We talked about God. It was good. Take risks. Go on adventures. It, 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 it's so important. I, I'll end with this one. A while ago, my wife and I were out with co coffee with some friends and just getting a little dessert or coffee uh, kind of after dinner. And, and our waitress was very pregnant, uh, you know, Maybe uh, as as much or more than Brittany. She goes, Brittany, you hardly look pregnant at all. I can hardly tell. I'm surprised, Matt, that you said anything about her being pregnant. Uh, and we had this conversation, and, and somehow the subject, I asked a lot of questions, and I found out that the father of the baby, she wasn't married, the father of the baby had broke up with her four, four days earlier. And she was just a few weeks from giving birth, and, and it led to her tears. And so we just kind of took some more risks, so we, we prayed with her, and we... We finished that night, and she gave us the bill, and we wrote a nice prayerful note, gave her our contact information, left her a huge tip. And she came back at the end with tears streaming down her face, and she, it was so meaningful for her. It was a simple little thing. It was adventure. Sometimes the adventure is going to Solon or, or getting involved with Pioneer or going to Romania. We have a team going to Romania in a couple of weeks. There's an adventure waiting. Take some adventures. Because when you do, sometimes God chooses to use you, use me. And lives are changed. And it brings joy and it brings laughter and fear and wonder that the God of the universe would use us. Those who hope in the Lord see the Lord's mission and their strength is renewed. Let's laugh more.
Let's pursue adventure more. And let's celebrate and tell stories of what God is doing. If we were in a small group setting right now, I'd give a couple questions for you to discuss as a little group. I might say, would you, is anyone aware of God doing something with their life? Is there aware of God increasing his activity in yours? Is there, he bringing healing? Is he bringing recovery? Is he restoring a relationship in you? Is he strengthening your faith? Share with the group. And when you do, there, there's, this, there's this spirit of celebration that just kind of grows. It's a good thing. My ask is, well, why should we have joy? Why should we have laughter? What blessings has God given us? Even when we're having a toothache or a bankruptcy or a marriage that's falling apart or a baby that's coming with no dad, what blessings have the world has God given us that would cause us to have joy in that time? Well, we're never alone. We're never alone. We're treasured. And we're forgiven. And we have hope. There's joy in the celebration that Jesus asked his followers to return to again and again. At one of his most difficult nights as a, as a human, the night in which he was betrayed, facing the cross, he formed a way to celebrate, and he took a piece of bread, and he said, this is my body, my presence given for you. Take this, remember this. And he took the cup. So this represents my blood that's about to be shed. Take this, remember my love. He didn't say laugh. He was reminding us to celebrate, to have hope, to worship him. So I don't, I don't know what you're going through this week. I don't know what you're going through right now, but we're going to have this little celebration right here. And I'm going to ask the servers to come. I'm going to have the worship team come up right now and take their place. The servers will come in a minute. But this represents a celebration we're to return to again and again. And there is in this tray uh, two cups. By the way, if you're home watching at home, take a minute right now and grab some crackers or grab a piece of bread, grab some juice or wine or whatever you might have, and, and you can do this at home as well. But there's a bread and piece of bread in the bottom. There's a cup on top. Take it apart. Hang on to it. We want to take this together. But when we do, we're celebrating. This is reason for joy. It's reason for self-examination. It's serious. If, if you're a follower of Christ, this is for you. If you're not, then maybe you just let it go. But if you know Jesus, take part of this and, and, and remind him of your joy. Tell him of your worship. Thank him for what he's done. Because it gives life. And as we enter our world, we will make a difference to the degree that God can show his life through ours to the world around us. Heavenly Father, Jesus, Son of God, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> You've given us so much. We want more at times. We want better. We want less pain. We want less worry. More hope. But ultimately, Father, we have reason to hope. We have reason to trust. We have reason to embrace. We have reason to worship. Thank you for your son's sacrifice. Thank you for the conception of it, for the implementation of it. Jesus, we thank you for your heart given, your blood given, your body given, so that we could have life. We worship you. We worship you. Let that spirit of worship be what people see in us, not for our own ego or pride, but to point to you. Thank you, Father. Bless us as we prepare for this act of worship. Bless the offering that's going to be taken at the door, the, the offering for those who are down and out. Let's put some nickels and dimes in the dollars in the plate to help those who are looking for help from our benevolent fund. We pray for that blessing. We, we, we pray for the offering prior to that when the ushers make their way to the, the room as we worship with their giving. Give us a spirit of joy and all that. But especially now around this table with this cup, with this bread, we worship you and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Service to you, come.